Welcome to Picks with the Professor, the show where a real statistics professor and his friends give you sports betting tips. I am your host, Professor Sides, and we are here talking college football 2023 season bets. Um, I don't know. What, what else am I supposed to say, guys? I, I mean, I'm really wondering who thought it was a good idea that we could have this show for going on three years now for college football. I mean, I'm not quite sure who's allowed, who allowed that, uh, but I'm happy for it, for sure. I, I was, you don't I ask was, questions you don't want the answers to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking this is our, only our second take uh, on this one, Cousin Jared. I was thinking the first show ever that we did uh, back in the 2021 season, three seasons ago. I, I think it took us like three or four times the first time to go through, just trying to figure out the technology. It, it's always fun, right? Moving a laptop to try to get better wireless connection, trying to find the correct lighting. Yeah, we, we had no idea what we were doing. Still don't fully know what we're doing, but definitely didn't know what we were doing. Yeah, we're going to do three uh, season preview shows here, just like we did last year. Uh, to set things up for you, viewer, we're going to do a contest here between Cousin Jared and uh, our friend Jake here. And we're going to uh, give each one $1,000, uh, make, uh, force them to, I mean, I'm not giving you, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you do what you want, you do. You get, get $1,000 for the contest. Mm -hmm. um, minimum uh, bet of $50, maximum bet $250 uh bet whatever you want in the season bets we'll track them all season long we'll have a little contest uh we'll have to figure out stakes uh what the loser has to do uh jake y y y we we cannot do the loser has to shave his head it, it has to be something if we do that it has to be you have to shave your beard i guess i don't know what we'd have to we'd have to figure something out i'll figure, I'll, i can do that we could do the the, or the waffle house challenge right i mean I, I feel like you know people have always wanted to do that right i do love waffle house I also love Waffle House. I'm sure at some point I would dislike it, but that doesn't sound like a punishment yet. But anyway. yeah, for for now, if you don't, if you or if you don't know what I'm talking about, there is a fantasy football league that's gotten popular. That the loot, the whoever comes in last place has to eat. They have, they have to stay in Waffle House for 24 hours, and they get to leave one hour early for each waffle they eat. I guess, and so usually it gets pretty uh, crazy by the like. 10th hour when it's like I, i've been here for 10 hours and i've eaten 10 waffles and now what do i do for my last four <laughs> um, so that's what we're what we're joking about uh we'll get to it here uh we're gonna just get right to it we're gonna start with the big 12 uh cousin jared you are up first we're gonna talk about cincinnati bearcats you are taking the under five and a half wins uh have at it yeah, so for me, this is basically, I think they have had a huge uh, step down in coaching this year. So Luke Fickle, we know what he did there. Absolutely unbelievable. Scott Satterfield, though, I'm just not completely sold. I, obviously, what he did at App State was impressive. But at some point, you kind of wonder how much of that was the infrastructure at App State uh, versus how much he actually did. When he lived, went to Louisville, I, I just feel like they were like always on the cusp of being good, but they never quite got there. They were inconsistent. And I look at what he did on offense, specifically with Malik, Malik Cunningham. It just never really seemed to get going. He had, had stops and starts, and you'd have really good games, and he'd have some really bad games. And let me tell you, what he had with Malik Cunningham on offense is a lot better than anything that he's going to have at Cincinnati this year. And I think the defense is going to take quite a step down as well with Luke Fickle leaving and how much he did for that unit. So as you're looking at the schedule there, you've got Eastern Kentucky, you've got Miami of Ohio, which seems like for sure wins, but uh, oh, it's boy, it's home, yeah. yeah, boys and girls in the Big 12 plus this year, um, there aren't going to be any easy wins on the schedule, I don't think. And, you know, you look on here, yeah, they could easily go above five and a half, but man, they've got some, some tough games here. Oklahoma, they have to go to at BYU, and then Houston and West Virginia, which I would probably – if I had to say, you know, in my opinion, the bottom two teams in the conference, both of those games are on the road for Cincinnati. They do get Iowa State at home. They do get Baylor at home. They do get Kansas at home. Uh, but I just think that this is going to be a significant step down for Cincinnati this year. And I just don't think that Scott Satterfield is going to be able to, you know, I think Luke Fickle was probably good for one and a half or two extra wins each season, just kind of on how good he was. And I don't think Scott Satterfield is going to, to bring that. I mean, how many times have we been in a season where we've been fading Cincinnati because they're winning these AAC games in previous seasons, you know, by one score late in the game where they kind of played around with their food and, you know, got a big lead late. But in the Big 12 plus, that's not going to work anymore. So I'm going under five and a half with, with Cincinnati here. So, Jake, uh, we know how Cousin Jared feels. When I look at this, because I'm curious if you see the same thing I do, I see a high variance schedule right here. I mean, I feel like if it's one of those things, and maybe this is the Luke Fickle effect that Cousin Jared's talking about, where if they've got everything clicking for them, you've got 
the ability to win a weaker road game and win a tougher home game. But the problem with that is if it flips and you just don't have it, then it makes all of those games tough. Uh, obviously, yeah, Houston and West Virginia, you know, weaker teams, but on the road, if they're not up to par, those could be losses in some of those games, you know, used to just circle Kansas, right. As, a, as an easy win. That's obviously not the case anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, Baylor, Iowa state at home, if they're not there, like, it feels like it could be a three win season if things don't go right, but it feels like if things click, it could be, they could win a bunch of close games. That's not maybe the easiest thing to do without a, a coach like fickle. Jake, I'm curious how you see it. Yeah. I, I just, this is why I didn't play it. I like to play it under five and a half, but I don't know what Cincinnati is without fickle, right? Like it's, I'm not a big fan of Satterfield, so I, like I don't trust them. I think this could be this is a terrible disaster scenario for all the momentum Cincinnati as a program built. You go mm-hmm. to step up to the big boy competition, and you're going to drop everything because it's new coach, new everything, going into places that are well established. And Big Twelve is not easy whatsoever mm-hmm. anywhere. So I mean. It feels like to get those two extra wins, like saying it's giving them Eastern Kentucky and Miami and even Houston and West Virginia, if you give them those, trying to find the two extra wins to go over that five and a half is I, – I don't see where they're going to do it. They're going to need some kind of magic. It, do, it does feel like they're going to be in a bunch of games that the spread is really close. Uh, that probably won't be the case for – at BYU or home against Oklahoma, uh, maybe not even at Oklahoma State, but it looks like a lot of them. I feel like it's going to be within one touchdown. And uh, yeah, it's it's definitely unfortunate timing. Uh, this was that whole weird thing about the bowl game last year, right? With the one coach coaching the other team. That was that was that yeah. weird scenario, yeah. which I kind of completely forgot about. And then you start talking about these names, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was bonkers. The whole like just walk across the other sideline and like be over yeah. there for you know your new team. And I can't remember which did they play in the game at Fenway where both teams I are actually so. on the same sideline. I so. Think it was so. even more awkward, if yeah. I recall correctly. <laughs> that has to yeah. be planned. That had to be planned. Yeah. 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 All right. So, uh, Cousin Jared, you've got uh, betting $100 of your $1,000 on this under yeah. Cincinnati. Five and a half wins minus 115. Uh, so, we'll turn it over to Jake. Jake, you've got Oklahoma over nine and a half wins. Here is their schedule. Um, at Texas? Is that, a, is that a typo? Where's the asterisk? Where's the asterisk on some, here, people? Yeah. Somebody had to be home, right? <laughs> I guess so, but but played a new at a neutral site. I mean, come on, that's we know where this game's gonna be played. Uh, uh, Jake, you're on the over nine and a half wins. Uh, t- tell us more. Look, I think last year was kind of a fluky year, right? Venables trying to get his feet wet, running the whole program. I mean, they still performed well, and even if you look at the last what seven games of the year after that embarrassment with Texas, uh, they won three of them, and all the losses were. A field goal, a couple – like the Texas Tech was overtime. Um, Florida State being one of those losses was an, was an extremely good team at the end of the year uh, was a three-point game. I I just think there's a lot of talent here. Gabriel still had a good year. Uh, there's enough talent there, Norman, to replace the losses of Mims and Gray. Uh, defensively, that's where variable shines. Going to fix all those issues. Uh, they struggled sacking the quarterback and – that led the, that made the secondary look a lot worse than what it was. I think that gets fixed. Secondary looks better because the quarterbacks don't have all day to throw it. Uh, I think the schedule kind of breaks for them, right? You you uh, you don't get TCU, and then uh, you go to you, Cincinnati. You get TCU. And, you get or, you get TCU at home. Yeah, getting TCU at home, uh, uh, dodging Kansas State is a good one. I mean, Texas neutral, uh, which. Which Kansas State's always been a trouble spot for yeah, Oklahoma for whatever reason. The last, yeah. I mean, it, I don't know, decade almost, it seems like they've just given them a lot of trouble. Yep. Yeah. And I, I mean, that October part of the schedule is going to be where everything gets weird. They, or not weird, kind of make or break, right? You've got one home game in October, and then the rest of it, you're on the road. I mean, you're on the road really at Texas, but they're recording the ESPN here, but. Uh, no. So, like, if they can make it through that without just losing all of them and maybe even going 500, I think this not 10 wins is going to be easy. They definitely already are prepped for the SEC with that cupcake non-conference schedule. Uh, Cousin Jared, you know a thing or two about cupcake non-conference schedules uh, with your team being the SEC, I guess, right? I mean, 
let's, I mean, we're playing Miami last year, playing Miami this year. We're playing Notre Dame next year. I don't, I mean, yes, we can, ca- you know, throw stones about the SEC out of conference schedule, but I don't think AM is one of the yeah. teams you can throw stones at. Fair. Not, yeah. Fair. Fair, fair. Uh, uh, yeah, we, get, we get Bama every year, so I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> we got, I mean, three easy wins pretty much for Oklahoma here to start yeah. off. We talked about Cincinnati maybe being down, home game against Iowa State. Uh, you know, UCF at home should be a solid win. Kansas obviously improved. Uh, if if OU is back, right, that would be the win. You have a tough one at Bedlam, of course. I mean, the, the, the three, right, sorry, the four question mark games you really have would be Texas, which – Whoever, who knows what Texas ever is going to be. Um, at Oklahoma State, is obviously going to be a big challenge. At BYU, that's a really tough place to play. I don't know if BYU will have the depth by that point of the year. And so that's the other thing that I like about this over is, uh, you know, by this point of the year, if BYU stepping up, you know, that's where some of these teams have struggled uh, with depth. That was what TCU struggled with depth so much when they first stepped up to the Big 12. Uh, that's at the end of the year. And then, of course, TCU is a, is a, a big question mark game, but at home. So kind of like I said, it, it breaks well for them uh, where they should have a bunch of them that are pretty easy. And they just got to get a couple of the tough ones to get to 10. Uh, Cousin Jared, do you have any uh, any rebuttal, any comments about uh, Jake's pick here of over nine and a half wins for OU? We touched on a couple of the teams that Oklahoma is not playing, but I would also mention that they don't have to play Baylor which has historically given them some fits as well. And they also don't have to play Texas Tech, who they lost to last season. And don't get don't get me wrong, Texas Tech, not an excellent team, but Texas Tech plays a type of offense that can really get you in trouble. You make a few mistakes, Texas Tech can make those mistakes add up quickly. So uh, I do think they kind of got a really favorable schedule here. I feel like this is a, a, a well-set line, but I Oklahoma is definitely one of the teams that I, I'm watching this season because if they get it right with a defensive-minded coach, but that up-tempo offense with Gabriel quarterback, I think they can have a really good season and their defense was the biggest issue last year uh that yeah. game against kansas where they were just just going back and forth up and down the field was a lot of fun yeah. same thing happened in tech and i believe we had tech on the money line in that game uh you mentioned textile play text yeah. aggressiveness and that's where OU struggled was on defense that's the big thing like you say defensive mighty coach if he's going to turn it around he's the type of guy to do that and that sets them up for success but uh you know oklahoma last year the first you know, they're, they're worst, one of their worst seasons in, in like 50 years. You know, uh, you know they, they're just consistently so good. Uh, just randomly, like every decade or two, they have a season like that. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of a lot of uh, chairs were thrown in Norman last year, I feel like, um, yeah, yeah. based off of the lack of success last year, based off what they're used to. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Jake. They, they, that one SEC, going into the SEC and all that, it doesn't, you don't want to be 0-2 against Texas. You don't want to have two losing streaks in a row or losing seasons in a row. So that, that there's a little extra motivation there. Yeah, yeah, Jake. Uh, how many? Uh, how much of your thousand dollars are you are you uh, putting on this one? I am putting a hundred on this one. Hundred on this one. Okay, and then last of the Big Twelve, back to you, cousin Jared. Iowa State over uh, five and a half wins. Uh, I mean, obviously Iowa, Iowa state, I feel like every year that has become much must see TV. Um, yeah. especially, you know, if you, if you enjoy a good punt fest, a good defensive minded yeah. contest, right. It's always the weather sometimes gets wonky. Uh, are, are you counting on the Iowa victory or do you think they could squeeze out six wins? Um, four conference wins plus the two, uh, kind of gimmies in non-conference. Well, I, I, I think that, that that Iowa game is going to be a very big one. I also think a, a trip to BYU on November 11th is going to be a really big game. We feel a lot more a lot better about this pick if that game were either being played in Iowa or not being played in November uh, at, at BYU. But uh, I think those two games are ones that are really going to kind of determine how their season, go, season goes. I'm also looking at that game where they host Oklahoma State uh, because Oklahoma State, I, I don't really know what to expect uh, with them this year. But with Iowa, Iowa State, I mostly want to just set aside, you know, maybe the schedule specifically this year and just look at what uh, Iowa State has been as a program um, since, and I'm blanking on his name right now, I'm going to go with Matt Campbell, took over. Um, They have been basically the same team almost every season. And some seasons they have good luck and they'll win nine games. Some seasons they'll have bad luck like last season and they'll win three or four games. Most seasons, they're just going to keep chugging along and they're going to win six or seven games playing the same type of football and everything. I I think that we may be going a little overboard with what we saw last year when they had one, two, three, four, 
five, six conference losses by one score. I mean, they were in almost every single conference game that they played, and they just need one or two bounces to go their way instead of the other way. And this would have been another six win, seven win Iowa State team. So I I, I look at the schedule. There's not really anything here. It's, I mean, it feels like a lot of toss up games. And so I think if we just look back on what Iowa State has been, that's the best projection that we can use going forward for them. And I think that's going to put them at six or seven wins again this season. What I would also say is I just, I feel like Iowa State has a floor. And I'll, some of these teams that are going to be in the Big 12 plus this year, I don't quite know where their floor is at, whether that's Oklahoma State, whether that's TCU. They, TCU lost so much or they can be able to you know, bring all the people in via the portal like they did before. Cincinnati, we already talked about. BYU, not sure what to make of them. So I just feel like with Iowa State, I kind of know what I'm getting in this new conference where I think anything is possible. I feel like Iowa State's one of the teams where I know what I'm getting, and I think that's going to end up with about six wins this season. Yeah, and I, I I can't really speak for every conference. I, I don't follow them quite as well. I try to keep my thumb on uh, you know the whole landscape of college football every season, of course, but I follow the Big 12 a little bit more intently. And one of the best predictors for the Big 12 is – you know, look at the good luck, bad luck kind of thing and expect it to bounce back the next year. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to flip 180 and swing the other way. It just means it's going to be about pretty even. I think about this as a Baylor fan. There was one year where everything went against, uh, you know, the team. And then the next year they won seven, eight games. There was the one year that they made the conference championship that was insanely lucky the team wasn't that good they just won every close game and then you know you just expect that bounce back the next year and it's one of the better predictors um and so it's again not that we think that iowa state will magically get lucky in those close games it's just that they're more likely to just go 50 50 and if people are overreacting to that then it can create a little bit of value in the line being mispriced uh jake do you have any comments on iowa state yeah i think tcu took all their luck last year for those one score games so i yeah. think i think it's going to get flip flop this year so iowa state might be playing for the conference title or up, the, the college football playoff, you know? Who knows? Well, up, up, up until that Kansas state game where the refs and the review thing and whatever. Yeah. I'm still bitter about that whole thing. Um, how, how that game ended and, and what it cost us uh, at big 12. That's the three we're going to cover there. Any uh, last thoughts before we move, uh, move conferences? I, I, I want to, I want to, well, I said, yeah, <laughs> Who knows? always. Texas is always back. Texas is always back, and then they're not back. Uh, it's right. always, uh, Professor. I want to ask you. I, I've heard so much about every team in in the Big Twelve Plus, and honestly, I feel like there's about ten teams that you could tell me was playing for a conference championship, and I would believe you. Uh, but I haven't heard a lot about Baylor. Why? Why is that? Why is Baylor maybe not being put at the same level as some of these other teams in, in the Big Twelve? I think that Baylor's problems revolve around the quarterback. And that's going to be the big question mark. And if they can get good quarterback play, they'll be right in the thick of things. Because as you mentioned a couple of times, this conference is wide open and, and we don't really know what to expect from almost any team in this conference. It's it's one of the more bizarre ones to think about. Uh, but their quarterback play last year was so dreadful by the end of the season. It was bad decisions. It was a weak arm strength. And and it was just every game. You could just count on that game kill, uh, drive killing yeah. interception. And oftentimes it happened right before the half, um, which was yeah. even better. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, that's going to be the biggest thing. They were supposed to have a freshman come in. He ended up not going there. So uh, I, I think personally, I'm a little bit concerned about what they have at quarterback. And um, I was, I was hoping for an upgrade and for a change. And I think I'm not expecting that. And so I think that's going to make it potentially a long season, although they'll probably be just like a lot of teams in a bunch of coin toss games, but when you don't have a good quarterback play, you tend to lose them. So I think that's why there's really not a lot of hype about this Baylor team. Uh, if they get something figured out with quarterback, or if they just decide to run the, uh, uh, the Wildcat all season, which I don't know, why wouldn't that work? Because this conference is going to be so crazy. You know, why not try it? Yeah, and, and maybe that's a, a takeaway just from talking this out a little bit. Maybe as you know, somebody who's making investments in the big, on these Big Twelve football games, maybe it's more of a week to week thing than a, a season long thing. You, you look at you know, team had a down week one week, they're probably going to bounce back. Every week is going to be like you said, a ton of toss up games. So maybe that's something we look for in the Big Twelve this season. Just take some of our, our short plus odds on the money line and roll with it. And that's, a, and that's a great point r real quick, too. I know, Jake, I know you mentioned this last year, that the notes that you made for the season prep shows helped guide you early on through the season uh, and kind of know what to look for. And so that's the other thing, too, about this prep work, because it's not just about the takeaways for the season bets. It's what can we learn and how can we handle our approach going forward? And, Cousin Jared, you're, you're absolutely right there that, that the – the bounce back thing, right? I mean, that kind of is somewhat a little bit real simply because you're dealing with 19 year old kids who, 
you know, have good weeks and bad weeks of practice. And you're more likely to have a good week of practice going to lead to better attention, better game planning, et cetera, uh, when you come off those losses. So there's things to look for in this conference, which I, I think is going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, but I honestly have no idea what's going to happen because it's just going to all be about who plays who. And that's never been a thing in the Big 12. It's been everybody yeah. plays everybody. Yeah. And so now it's going to be just a whole new world uh, for one year and then a whole new world after that with, with Texas and Oklahoma, of course, going to the SEC, which we're going to go to next. We'll talk first about Tennessee. Jake, you are a Tennessee fan. Um, you know, you got a couple of gimme wins with the, uh, you know, SEC schedule, uh, UTSA at home, uh, you know, Austin P. Uh, UConn, as as good as UConn is, and Cousin Jared and I loved the UConn story from last year, uh, they were still like the fifth worst team in college football or something. They just, you know, <laughs> had, yeah, you know, they were much improved and, uh, you know, really weak schedule, but that's, you know, that's a win. Vanderbilt's a win. I mean, you got a lot of, got a guaranteed wins here. Uh, Jake, why are you on the under nine wins? Like the biggest reason is um, October 21st and 28th. That is two rough, rough games, going to Bama and going to Kentucky. Um, I don't see a world where they win both. I say, I think it's a lot more likely that they'll lose both, especially with, like, if it was the other way around, where it was at Kentucky, then Bama, I think the split would be more likely, but that's going to be, that's tough. Like, there's a there's a good chance they're, what, 6-0 and going into that, and then it's like the wheels are going to fall apart, fall off for the the – over nine because trying to get four wins off the that or, yeah four wins off the last part of that schedule is going to be tough because I mean Missouri's not a give me uh, Georgia's a loss Vandy does weird things and I mean I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the I'm gonna give you the win against Vanderbilt I'm just I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna throw that out there but, but <laughs> like and also I think a lot of that as great as Milton is and as fun as it is to let him launch the ball. Or an orange, or whatever. One of the one of the best arms in college football, hands down. I mean, just a lot of fun to watch him launch it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible how far he can throw a ball. But his big thing has been accuracy and hitting those short passes. Uh, Hooker was extremely efficient. I think he had like four interceptions over the two years he started. I don't see that. I think that helped out a, a tremendous amount. I don't see that Milton having that kind of. Uh, season where he's just not turning the ball over hardly ever uh, he's going to be a good runner we're loaded with talent still a very good team i just don't think the schedule sets up well because i mean it, texas a&m isn't isn't easy at florida is going to be tough i mean that's a huge game we haven't won there since 2003 like it's as great as last year was and all the momentum we have i just don't see 11 10 11 win season here i, I think nine is the cap and where this one's ends. So you, th- you think it's either a win or a push. Because, uh, Jared, can your Texas A&M Aggies win the game against Tennessee in Tennessee? Well, I, I think that towards the end of that conversation, you hit on, on the key point. You mentioned the October 21st and October 28th, which definitely important games. But I would look at the month-long stretch from September 16th to October 14th, where you've got Florida, UTSA, South Carolina, and A&M. Um, me personally, I might exclude Florida from this conversation. I don't think Florida is going to be uh, very good this season, but still a, a rivalry game. You never quite know what's going to happen. On the road, I, th- yeah. I think if you lose one of Florida, South Carolina, A&M, or UTSA, which I think is definitely possible. South Carolina played great at the end of the season. A&M, yes. who, knows who knows what you're going to get from, from A&M. And then again, Florida, that rivalry game. If you lose one of those games, I think you're setting yourself up for a push at worst by taking the the under nine. So if I were analyzing this, I think that four bank stretch there is probably uh, the most important one. To your specific question, the can AM win? Probably not. Uh, not on the road, I, I don't think. But still, AM is going to, you know, I, even though they got a new offense coordinator, I think they're going to slow the game down, try to limit the number of possessions that Tennessee is going to have. And if you do that effectively, then who knows? The clash, um, of, sti- the clash of styles can be kind of a little bit of an equalizer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I think that month long stretch is going to be important, though. And if you lose one of those, I think you're looking at a push at worst. Jake, my, my counter to you is I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, uh, we had a, a money line pick on Tennessee in the bowl game against another team in orange that was heavily favored and Tennessee looked really good. So what's that? That's, I think, the big counter to how how are you going to talk people into going under when we all saw that game? And, and obviously Clemson's offense had their issues, but their defense wasn't bad. And and you looked great on offense at that game. Yeah, I mean. 
like I said, Milton's good. I don't think this Tennessee team will be bad. I just think the way the schedule sets up really hurts them. Uh, also, I just – that's one game, right? Yeah. Sure. Look at Milton at Michigan. Look at Milton when he first came to Tennessee. He's improved everywhere he's went. But, man, I just, the, I just don't trust him to be as careful with the ball as Hooker was. Hooker seemed to never make the wrong call, never make the wrong decision. I just don't see that happening for Milton because I think Hooker was special. Like, and that's not a knock against Milton. It's just Hooker was that kind of good. And if you start giving the ball away, the, the defense is already tired because they're on the field so often. You give them yeah. extra possessions out there. It's not great. One of those. One of those. If we're thinking about you know NCAA football, right? You know, playing the video game, right? You know, it's not that it's not that you're at a seventy quarterback rating now. You know, you've got a guy who's still an eighty six or a ninety one or whatever. You had a ninety eight or, or whatever. You know, the appropriate numbers would be. Um, yeah, and you're right. He he obviously you know should have been getting some good Heisman love there if it wasn't for the unfortunate injury. Um, and of course, we, I don't know if we'll cover them specifically there, but South Carolina, of course, is just a huge question mark as well based off of how much they improved. And finally, at the end of the season, getting what we kind of thought from the offense, what we knew was always capable with the defense and like everything clicking for them. You know, how real is that? You know, big question mark there. Uh, Because Jared, your Iowa State, when you had a hundred dollars on that one, uh, Jake, for this Tennessee one, how much are you on this one? But in one big, I go 150 on this one. 150. All right. Uh, fade, fading his team uh, f- to the tune of $150 from Tennessee. Right. That's right out of my playbook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, we'll go back to here for Kentucky over six and a half wins. Uh, Cousin Jared, I'm pretty sure you were on the under for Kentucky last year, preaching that pretty hard. Is that correct? Yeah, I was on the over two years ago uh, on the under last year. Got, got that, Nailed and it. I, it's it's time to to uh, you know, oh my, how the turns have tabled. Uh, I, I'm going the turn over tables this have year. turned. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go over six and a half here. And I'm going to make this bet for um, 100. I, I think that okay, when you look at Kentucky again, very similar to Iowa State in my opinion, that you kind of know what you're getting. They have a very specific brand of football. And last year, they kind of got messed up because Will Levis got hurt. They had some injuries to to the running backs. I know Kabatsia has smoked since transferred. But I think we might be, uh, you know, looking at Will Levis's play last year, might be masking over the fact that they also had a new offensive coordinator last year. Well, the offensive coordinator from two years ago has since come back. He went back to the Rams for a year. And now he's come back. Uh, the OC is going to be Liam Cohen this year. I think that him being back will have just as much a, a positive effect as maybe him him leaving did last year. I think that their offense is going to improve simply by him being back and specifically the scheme that he ran uh, really helped them out. And I mean, Honestly, do we think that Devin Leary, formerly of NC State, Mm -hmm. could be any worse than what Will Levis was last year? And again, I know Levis was injured and everything, but I think that Leary is probably going to give you more consistent play than than what Levis did. I think this Kentucky defense is still going to be just as sound as it ever was. When you look at the schedule here, I feel like personally, I think they start off five and zero. Oh because you got, you yeah, know. you got, you really do. You have five wins, and you're sp- you're sprinting to get those five, and then you're holding your breath to get two more. Yes, and again, depending on how you feel about Florida, my personal opinion, this is still the first month of the season. If Florida is still rolling with Graham Mertz at the end of September, something has gone wrong, in my opinion. So again, I think they start five and zero, oh, and then you've got Missouri, Mississippi State, South Carolina, and Louisville, and I'm just asking them to win two, go five hundred in those four games there. So um, I'm putting. 100 on Kentucky over six and a half. I think that the new offense coordinator and a slightly more consistent quarterback is going to get them uh, over the six and a half win number. And and Jake thinks that you know that the home gaming in Tennessee might be a win too. So there's there's that added bonus too for you. Yeah, I, I definitely think that could be like because especially coming off of Missouri that they could really be ready for Tennessee there. Well, yeah. with the bye and the bye week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the timing. The timing of that bye week. I mean, this sets up for, and I guess just put this on your on your calendars, uh, people. This sets up really well for Kentucky coming off a, a home game against Missouri, which should be they should be decent favorites there. Bye week. While Tennessee comes off of Alabama, and we have seen a number of teams in years past play Alabama, and who knows how this year Alabama's team is going to be, but play Alabama, and the next week kind of struggle, look a little bit sluggish. I mean, this sets up pretty well for Kentucky if they're going to pull the upset, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, 
this, they could Kentucky could be sitting in the same spot Tennessee was last year towards the end of the, which is scary that the South Carolina game for if you're a Kentucky fan, it's scary that that South Carolina game is in that same spot in Columbia, um, but because I mean they, their schedule not as great, but uh, you know you you look at what maybe a one loss season if they right, after Baylor. Yeah, it's one of those things where, I mean, this line's at six and a half, and obviously it may be, they may be, you know, six and five going to Louisville. I mean, that's very possible, right? But yeah, it's like we talked about, right? If things break right for them, you know, you just talk, you talk about Georgia as a loss, but home against Missouri, very, very winnable. Home against Tennessee, like we talked about, sets up well for them at Mississippi State. If they're playing well, they can win that. Then you just got to pull a home upset over Alabama, and all of a sudden you're, like you said, looking like Tennessee was at the end of the season going, We've only lost one game. <laughs> like we're having a dream season here, heading into that South Carolina game. Which again, I have no idea what to make of that team. Oh yeah, that's it is a. I don't know. It's it's wild how that can exactly mirror Tennessee from last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, and then we've got one more SEC game or team here for you. Florida under five and a half wins. Uh, I feel like we've already had enough Florida hate already. So. Uh, how much more is there to be said? You look at the schedule, of course, you do get, uh, I mean, a, a literal gimme home against McNeese, uh, who is, I believe, still FCS. Home against Charlotte, also a gimme. But you've got that Florida State non-conference game. That's going to be very tough. At Utah, it's going to be very tough. I mean, that's two really tough non-conference games uh, at LSU, at Missouri, at South Carolina, at Kentucky. That's some tough games there. Um, Florida under five and a half, even money. On this one, I, I'm all I'm all over this one. I'll, this is probably one of my like favorite plays. So I was the Tennessee one because tell tell me where the what three three other wins come from after Vandy. Yeah, stretch. yeah. I mean, you got you got v- Vandy, Charlotte, McNeese, three wins. Uh, I guess home against Arkansas. I don't know. Yeah, that, they, they could. They could easily. Go, they could easily have three wins on the season. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's very possible. And I mean, I, you got Napier. I don't know how much patience. I think he's a good coach, but I don't know how much patience Florida's going to have with him with two seasons. What with what I see happening here, uh, you've got a new QB with a new OC and has to completely rebuild an offensive line because they're all gone. Uh, and this QB, and I mean, this QB is not going to be a top five pick if we're just going to be kind to Graham Mertz and uh, Miller. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. and they're definitely not as athletic. So the running game is going to like the running backs are going to have to carry the offense. Defense is solid with talent, but I mean, are you going to be able to stop Tennessee or, or Georgia's offense? I mean, Kentucky, Kentucky seems like they'll dominate them at home too. I mean, Arkansas's got Jefferson and uh, Sanders coming back. What, like, I, I just don't see where they score points, especially against LSU on on anybody after after Vanderbilt. So you, you might give them South Carolina, but that's on the road. And the South Carolina team, if they play like they did at the end of last year, they're I think they'll beat beat the brakes off Florida. It's I, I don't know. I this I feel bad for Napier. Yeah, I, I think I think your hope. If you're going on the over, if you're trying to get the six, if you're a Florida fan hoping for bowl eligibility, you know, I, I, your hope is uh, at South Carolina versus Arkansas at Missouri, I, I guess would be your three that you're circling. But uh, I definitely could see them winning one or two of those. But to get all three of them or to pull something else off does seem unlikely. Uh, Cousin Jared, you have been hating on Florida. Why are you not also on this pick? Well, I am also not on this pick uh, for no good reason other than I have other picks that I, I like a little mm-hmm. bit more. Uh, but what I will say is that I think the, the biggest game here is South Carolina on October 14th. Um, I think they've got three wins going into that game. And well, I mean, I think they've got three wins. I mean, Vanderbilt showed a little bit of spunk at points last season, but I think they've got three wins going into that South Carolina game. And the problem is if you have one bounce go the wrong way against South Carolina and you lose that game, you're probably going to get your teeth kicked in the next week against Georgia. And then things could start really spiraling and you're not going to get much forgiveness with Arkansas. Definitely not going to get any forgiveness with LSU. And then you've got a Missouri team sandwiched in between that LSU game and your, your rival Florida state, who also I think is going to be pretty good Mm -hmm. um, this season. So I, I think that South Carolina game is the one I'm looking at. If they win that game, they have a chance to go over. If they lose that game, I, I think that that's probably it. 
And of course, ESPN slacking here needs that asterisk next, asterisk next to that game because Florida Georgia obviously be played in Jacksonville. Um, well, it's it tough financial go. times. They're having to lay people off. The person who put in the asterisk got laid off. Probably true, but also who cares where that game is being played? They're not going to be Georgia. Um, I don't think it, it really matters. At least about Oklahoma, it's like, oh, it does matter where that game is. Like that kind of affects right, you know, right, how you yeah. view it. This one, it doesn't really affect anything. Um, Florida under five and a half. Jake, how much are you putting on this one? I'm throwing 50 on it. Throwing 50 on this one. Okay, that then wraps up the SEC. We will move to the ACC Duke under six wins. Jake, you're on this one at even money. Um, you know, again, like all college football teams, you got a couple of gimmies there versus Lafayette. Obviously, should be a gimme at UConn. I'm not sure that's a gimme. If it's at home, maybe on the road. UConn was so improved, like that could at least be close. Uh, you know, then the rest of it's the ACC, and we can almost loop back to our Big 12 discussion where we just say, who the heck knows? There's a lot of question marks on a lot of these teams. Uh, obviously, I hope somebody talks about Virginia as we um, get through this discussion and given their uh, situation. The big question with Duke is what Duke are you going to get? I feel like we kind of tend to know by about week four or five, whether we're going to get the solid, good defensive minded Duke, or if we're going to get the Duke that just falls flat on their face. Cause it, it feels like every couple of years, they just swing wildly between solid and terrible. Uh, Jake, I guess you're either going, you're going for the more terrible version of Duke. You do not think they are going to get to a bowl. Uh, tell us more. Yeah. I just, like I think this Duke team will be improved over last year, so it's just wild. I think they'll have a better team. I just think I mean look look at the schedule. You've got you open with Clemson and then you get lost. So you're, you're you're one and one. Northwestern at home, probably a win. Probably Since win. Northwestern has that one on state side in two years. Uh, so then Why UConn is a is a toss up. Notre Dame NC State, who I don't, I'm not exactly sure what they're going to be this year, but then at Florida State, at Louisville, at North Carolina, and Pittsburgh to finish, it is going to be very tough to get to seven wins. And I think they might be a better team. I just think they're just their schedule was super easy last week, last year, and they've got the opposite this year. They surprised everybody, and I think a lot of that had to do with the schedule and that Elko is turns out is a pretty good coach. Um, I just Riley Leonard. I think he's going to be a stud, but I don't think he's enough here. I don't think they've got enough talent on the offensive end to score enough points to win some of these games. And I don't know that the defense is good enough to hold everybody down. A lot of luck last year. Like I said, I think they're improved, but, man, I don't see them getting six wins. I think this might be a four or five win season. Mm, Because, Jared, we were on Duke a little bit towards the end of last season. They were – you know, I think we were a little stubborn before we kind of got on, got behind them until we finally just kind of threw our hands up and just said, we're just going to start backing them like every game now. And it worked out because they were just a covering machine. Uh, you know, what, what is, what is your take on their season? My take on their season is that if you compare their 2023 schedule to their 2022 schedule last year, when they won, how many games did they win last year? Nine games. Wow. They won nine games, uh, won yeah. a bowl game, eight regular season wins and a, won a bowl game. They missed Clemson, they missed Florida State, and they did not have Notre Dame on the schedule. I think those were, you know, last season, those were replaced by three toss-up games. This year, I think it's basically three guaranteed losses. And so, you know, you take that eight-win regular season and kind of reverse that. I think you get back down to five. So um, I think six is the right way that I would lean here. If I had to pick a side, I think I would go under. But I think six is a a pretty well-set line. And it's basically just they had a great schedule last year, and they kind of got the opposite of that this year. They got a really tough draw in the ACC. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and the other thing about this one, I, I'm gonna, I'm just going to point out here, September 16th to 23rd, that can kind of be a little bit of make a break in this. If they lose both of those games, you've won this bet. You could just count oh, yeah. your money. Yeah. You know, yeah. if they, if they split, you're in decent shape. You know, if they win both of them, you're still alive. You know, they yeah. can still yeah. be three and one, and you and you're still fine. And so it's nice when it sets up that way because you got a chance to know early on how you're going to do if, if you've got it. And worst case scenario, you're still alive because the ACC can be tough. Duke's biggest issue that they've had in years past, and we talked about this a little bit with some of the other teams, and then not that they're transitioning, but 
their biggest issue has at times them and Wake Forest both being smaller schools have had depth issues. And if they lack the depth by the end of that season, it could turn into some issues if they have injuries. Obviously, nobody hopes for that, but we know that's a part of uh, part of the game. So, uh, Jake, oh, how much you have on this one? I'm putting 50 on this one. 50 on this one. All right. And then uh, that takes us to Miami, whose total is set at seven and a half. Uh, this one should be fun. Uh, we got two picks on this one. We got we got going both ways. We got a head to head here. Uh, this could make or break the whole contest. Because uh, Jared, you're on one side, Jake, you're on the other side. Because Jared, I will let you start us off. Seven and a half wins. Are you over or under, and why? I am going under seven and a half, and I am doing that uh, for fifty dollars. Uh, you know, the past couple of uh, teams that I have picked, I talked about looking at their like you know total what they are as a program over the past five, 10 years, not looking specifically at the results last season. If you're kind of applying that to Miami, I would say zoom out and look at Mario Cristobal and what he has done over his time at the head coach as my uh, of Miami and at Oregon. And the thing is, is that a big part of Miami's issues last year were their lack of offensive production. They just weren't very good at all on offense. The problem is, is that Mario Cristobal at this point has a track record of having not great offenses just about everywhere that he's coached. Mm. If you go back far enough, you'll recall that he had Justin Herbert and somehow managed to make Justin Herbert look pedestrian, which kind of seems you know a little hard to imagine at this point. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think we were all a little surprised at how good he was in the NFL. We were like, where was this playing weaker competition? Like, how, yes. how did this happen? Yeah, exactly. And I think that... We're we obviously saw a similar situ situation with Tyler Van Dyke last year. and But the problem is they got a new offensive coordinator. They're bringing in the air raid system. It's um, nothing that Cristobal has, not an offense that he's ever really run before. But the thing is, is that I've just seen enough, in my opinion, to know that he's, he you know, you don't like stereotype, but he's an offensive line coach. He wants to run the ball. He wants to, you know, keep time of possession in his favor and everything. And so when you're really leaning on this team to improve offensively, I just don't know that they have. They don't have a standout receiver. Definitely we've seen from Van Dyke in the past that, that he can play well. Um, but I just don't think that um, – I don't think that he's going to be able to turn around as much based on what we saw last year, turn around enough to give them the improvement that they need. I would also say, look at how they lost some of these games last year. They, they went five and seven. They only lost two of those games by one score. They had five losses by more than one score. And some of those games were to Duke, uh, which, you know, Duke was pretty good, but Duke still, you're Miami. You shouldn't be losing by multiple scores um, to Duke. Uh, and then Florida State, Clemson, and then they kind of just packed it in at the end of the season and got crushed by, by Pitt. So um, I just don't think that Miami has the right combination of things right now. I'm not saying that Cristobal is not going to be successful there. He definitely could be, but I think this is going to be another year where they end up about six or seven wins. And if they're going to make an improvement, it's going to be two years from now. Uh, I, I do feel like I have to clarify for the record that if we had ended, if we had used my end of season ratings last year, I would have had Duke as a 17 point favorite at UConn. So I just, I feel like I should come back and clarify that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there'll be 17 point favorites, but uh, anyway, I just, I just feel like I should. I, I would have laid the 17 points. Yeah. Oh, all right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Miami. Uh, that is the case for the under seven and a half. That one's got some juice, right? Yes, that is correct. And you would ask me that literally as soon as I just closed that tab. Minus, minus 145. Minus, minus 145. 145 on the other so, so, Jake, you're you're taking a chance with the plus odds. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got like plus 115 or so? Yes, plus 115. So, uh, okay. all, I think all, all odds courtesy bet online. If you don't have a, uh, an account there, sign up link in the show description. Uh, I should have said that earlier, but whatever. I'm terrible at this. Uh, Jake, why are you taking a chance on the over? Like I, I think the new offensive scheme will um, kind of make up some of the gaps there. And I think Miami also had a lot of bad bounces that go their way this time. Uh, Cause like there's not a great receiver on the team, but this air raid short routes turns okay guys into very good guys. Um, just cause it's, it's able they don't have to worry about beating people downfield. The defense is always loaded, has plenty of talent. Their, their defense is fine. It wasn't the issue. It's turnovers. And they lost 13 of their 15 fumbles last year. Mm. I don't think that happens again. I, I, I don't think – I mean, was this the NC State – was it NC State 
No, that was Interstate State Louisville that where it just literally oh, just kept handing one. the ball to Louisville. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what that doesn't even include this one. Uh so I don't think like it's gonna totally flip and Miami's gonna fumble 15 times or recover 13 of them, but I think it gets right. a little more. It should be pretty 50-50 on recovering fumbles. Yeah, it's all about how the ball bounces. Uh so I think you throw that in. I think some of those games get are a little uh closer <laughs> with Van Dyke as a good quarterback has a chance to make a win instead of being a couple score loss. Uh, they've got some good running backs. They've got a fairly easy schedule there. I mean, you got you have three absolute gimmies in your first four games with Miami, Bethune, Cookman, and Temple. I mean, that's just silly easy on those three. Yeah. And then, Texas, and then Georgia, 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 Georgia Tech may not be that great. Um, yep. Boston College to close the year may not be that great. Louisville home may not also, be that great. So, I mean, yeah. Also, I have Virginia, too. Um, so yeah. that's that's a cupcake win with how they're looking. Um, I mean, Texas A&M, I think, is a toss-up game, especially uh, for game two. Uh, the way last year went, that was, what, a two-point game, if, if I remember correctly. Eight, uh, eight points, but it feels like there were two-point points. score total, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was uh, going to yeah. say, if, if, if you, that was felt like the all-disappointment bowl last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, was. Yeah. 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 Um, but, they happen to swing that one this time. You're, you're looking really good. North Carolina, I'm not sure how good they will be. I mean, you got a new offense coordinator coming in there. I don't think they did anything to improve the defense. Uh, and I don't think the offense is going to be as good losing receivers like Downs and uh, stuff like that. So I, I think Clemson and Florida State are your only two for sure losses. And you're looking pretty good everywhere else. Because uh, of Jared. Talk about Virginia while we're here. While we're talking about the ACC, uh, I feel like you have to have a Virginia take for me. Uh, a, a Virginia take or or an, or an NC State take? I, I mean, guess we, there you go. The whole the whole yeah the whole, yeah whole. So, yeah. So I am I am very very hopeful that we're going to get a lot of points with NC State this season. Uh, reunited, Brennan Brennan Armstrong with his previous offense coordinator at Virginia. I'm going to go with Robert. A nine, I think it's a nine. It's A N A E. I think it's a nine. Um, anyway, he's going to be the offense coordinator there, and I think there's the potential to have some fireworks North uh, with North Carolina State offensively this season. Again, that is just me being hopeful. I have no idea what's actually going to happen, uh, but yeah, definitely hope that they're seeing improved offense there. Armstrong gets back to more what we saw two years ago, and not what we saw last year, which that was just not not fun for anybody. It was, it was a travesty to football. And yeah. I, my Virginia take on that would be you have to wonder there offensively how they're going to look, uh, yeah. given what they floundered with what we saw, a, a talent like Brandon yeah. Strong now losing yeah. him. Like, it's going to get even worse potentially yeah. for Virginia. So I I, I don't know. I, you know. Early in the season, maybe some Virginia team total unders look, look smart and uh, hopefully some NC State team total overs. Something I kind of yeah. think on early before other people maybe catch on and yeah. realize that uh, it'll take us to our last pick. Pick Jake, you are on Clemson over 10 wins. Obviously, uh, you know, Clemson establishing themselves as one of the blue bloods in college football and in the last couple of years, you know, being a little bit more up and down than what we had seen previously. It turns out that having an amazing running back really matters. And I feel like that's been the key for them the last couple of seasons. When they've had better running back play, they look solid. And when they haven't, it's been rougher. And the weaknesses at the quarterback position are then magnified or masked, depending on that running back play. Uh, when you got a guy to the backfield who can catch the ball and get, you know, 10 yards a, a touch or whatever we've seen in a couple, in a couple of years past, it can really solve all of your problems uh, offensively. What is their, what's the reason you think they're going to bounce back strong here and get over 10 this year? I mean, it's hard to find where they lose multiple games here. Uh, their schedule is about as perfect as you could ask for. Um, you get f anything of that's scary, except for maybe NC State, is at home. Every, like, so you're, you're going to be comfortable everywhere you go. Uh, I mean, Cade looked good in his last two – the two games he started, though, threw for almost 600 yards. Neither of those teams quite defensive-minded, but they weren't terrible. Uh, it's just – you got Shipley and your leading receiver coming, Antonio Williams coming back. You got four of your five starting offensive linemen coming back. Uh, he's got all these tools. He's got a what I think is a better offensive coordinator coming in from TCU with Riley. Uh, I think it'll he will do a lot better here. I mean, Florida State's your only threat um, to winning the conference. You get them early. You get them at home. Uh, so not a lot of chances for injuries to pop up between 
at Duke, Charleston Southern, and Florida Atlantic. Nothing scaring you there. I, I think the schedule breaks for them to win 10, 11, maybe, like maybe even undefeated. I don't know that they're necessarily going to be as good as their record shows at the end of the year, but I just think yeah. with where the ACC is at talent wise and uh, how their schedule plays out, I, I think this Clemson team will be very good. I mean, their defense is going to be extremely good again. It might not be as good as it was last year, but I mean, they'll go from like number five to number six. It's not that bad of a drop. Yeah, I feel like I've seen a few smart. Uh, betters out there on Twitter commenting uh, why they were going over was all schedule related um, that it would just sets up perfectly for them to have just a really high expected win count. So I know I have seen that take out there as well. Uh, obviously a lot of gimmies in the schedule. Like you said, a lot of the questionable games uh, that'll be a little tougher for them, you know, the Notre Dame's North Carolina's uh, Wake Forest, Florida state, right? All those at home. Um, obviously, with the te- with teams like Wake Forest and North Carolina, both of them, you know, in years past have had amazing offenses, but but really questionable defenses, and that's been the type of team that Clemson, you know, can kind of handle a little bit because if their offense is questionable, those defenses aren't good enough to stop them, and Clemson's defense is good enough to get a few stops. Um, so that you know breaks pretty well. I, I do have to worry about at Syracuse now. If that's a Friday night, I'm really worried about that game because I feel like Friday night games at Syracuse are tough. Um, yeah. Maybe it'll still be a night game because still night games at Syracuse sometimes get weird. It's a weird place to play, tough place to travel to. Um, but de- it definitely does feel like Clemson might be a team that is power rated a lot lower than they are ranked. Uh, definitely feels like it's on the table. Uh, Cousin Jared, I I remember two years ago. I feel like we always had running segments about Clemson and zigging yeah. and zagging. It was it was like our our favorite running gag basically was, was talking about Clemson that was two years ago, our, our first season doing this. Um, yeah. what, what is your take on, on this uh, Clemson season? Well, just to, to clarify a point that you just said about Syracuse having weird games, I would counter that just Syracuse just always has weird games. I mean, we had Fair. the Purdue game Fair. there that last was, season, which was, and that, was a, that was an 11 a.m. or noon kick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was just absolutely bonkers. That was, uh, I don't really think that it matters what time the game. Fair, at Syracuse. Fair. Um, <laughs> what I would say for those who might want to be seeing some, um, new blood in the college football playoff or something, or hoping that maybe the ACC will get, you know, turned upside down with Florida State being good. Personally, I think that Florida State is going to be really good this year. What I would say is that the last time that Clemson went outside of their, you know, coaching tree and hired an offense coordinator, they hired Chad Morris. And that kind of is what got Clemson started and made them the Clemson that that we know now. And so you, you mentioned that. That turned out to be a solid hire. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned Riley coming in. Uh, I'm I'm concerned that we might see another uh, offensive Death Star created here. I wouldn't say Death Star, but another very, very solid, very good uh, offensive uh, team created here. Um, but I don't really have anything to add to this. To your point, I think they've got uh, two very, very competitive games this year, Florida State, Notre Dame, both games at home. And if you look at maybe a step down from that, you've got North Carolina, NC State, and I'm going to go with, I think, South Carolina. And you've got two of those three at home as well. And so really, to y'all's point, I think the schedule just sets up so perfectly here that uh, maybe, in worst case, you're looking at a push. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I It's an interesting take there with Clemson. We know defensively that they uh, you know, can definitely bring it. And if when they get things figured out offensively, uh, yeah. They're obviously a, a really good team. Uh, but, you know, again, when you're talking about season bets, part of it is how good the team is. Part of it is the schedule. And so yep. it's one of those uh, – it's an interesting take here why, why the over might be a solid play for you. Is if they get things well offensively, then you're very likely to hit this over. If yep. they don't, you still got a chance with the way the schedule breaks. And so you kind of have two ways to hit it, which is always the way you want to play these uh, season-long bets. Uh, gentlemen, any – Parting takes, any closing words, uh, ACC, SEC, Big 12, college football, baseball? I just, I just can't wait for college football to get started. I had so much fun last year with it. And I, I think that I was high on that Florida State team all year, and I think we're really going to see them shine this year. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they, they found their way into, into the playoff with everything they're bringing back. Is Florida State in Clemson, are they able to play each other in the conference championship game? I, I can never. Yes, I believe this is the first season that ACC has eliminated divisions. Oh, okay. I didn't realize, I didn't realize I, ACC I, eliminated yeah. divisions. I, 
I knew that was a thing. The Pac-12 did it last year, uh, I guess. And that was the first one that was, I mean, the Big 12 had, I mean, had done it, but that's different. They didn't have divisions in the first place, only the teams. Yeah. Uh, the Pac-12 doing it was very weird at the end, thinking through all those tiebreaker scenarios in that last week because of the way all that played out. And I knew others were doing it. I was thinking that was the case this year with the ACC, that it would be uh, top two teams. So that could make for, uh, and, and they des- desperately needed it because the ACC yeah. championship game has long been, yeah. A laugher of a game, you know, yeah. nine out of 10 years, it seems like nine of the last 10 years or so. Um, it just hasn't been good for a long time. So uh, hopefully that at least creates a, a more competitive game. Of course, these season bets do not take into account uh, bowl games. You know, it's just regular season games, any extra stuff like that. You don't get to count it uh, either way. So uh, this is just based off of the 12 uh, regular season games, 13 in the cases of, I guess, whoever goes to Hawaii uh, would be the only ones, uh, I guess, who play 13. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. there's another one random one off that gets a 13 that I'm, I'm unaware of. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, I think we really just need to take this moment to have a moment of silence for the ACC Coastal and our dream of having six teams go six and six uh, is no longer the case since they don't all play each other. Uh, but yeah, I, I just can't wait till, you know, like week 10 of the season and I'm kicking myself. Why did I make two season long plays on two big 12 teams uh, when the big 12 plus is going to be unpredictable this year? Um, so really, I just look at these bets as a way to kick myself later in the season and uh, bring some sort of at least humorous agony uh, you know, to the proceedings. We'll definitely be able to talk about it each week, how how yeah. the bets have gone, how people are looking. Um, I love the Big 12 Plus. I had not heard that before. Uh, I love the name for that. Uh, well, next year, will it be the Big 12 Minus? Well, it, maybe. I mean, I'm also open to Bizarro Big 12. I, I mean, really, you know, I'm a man of the people. So w- whatever we think is the appropriate term, I'm good going with. I, I feel like it has to be something to do with the fact that they will actually have 12 teams, which will be confusing and yes. also yes. what's supposed to happen, but hasn't in a long time. Uh, yeah. You know, since they were the Big 12 10 and now they're the Big 12 14, at least next year, they'll be the Big 12. They will call it the Big 12 12. Uh, what, what is the Big 12 without Texas and Oklahoma, though? I think it'll be a lot of fun. It will be very yes. weird to yes. not have those teams in it. Uh, I, I think it'll be I think it'll be better because I, I think you won't have quite the distractions of Texas uh, every year taking, uh, I think, spotlight away from teams that are better. Um, yep. You know, so I think it'll be a lot of fun with the teams. I think it'll be wide open and, and crazy. I think it'll be I think it'll be great. But um it will be very weird to not have Texas at Oklahoma for sure. I think you hit on the key point though, fun, because I mean, that's, that's why we all love college football so much yeah. is because it's fun and it's going to be each week is going to be who the heck knows uh, legitimately. So I, I think they're going to be just fine with, well, at least for college football people like me, they're going to be just fine without Oklahoma and Texas. Yep. All right. Well, then that's all we've got. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Picks with the Professor. Remember, we still got baseball going on. Uh, that's obviously all, also a lot of fun. Keep you busy this summer. Make sure you're subscribing. Make sure you're checking us out on Dub Club. If you haven't yet, that sign up link is in the show description. Otherwise, we'll be back again with two more season previews. Uh, I told the guys for the small conferences, we'll have to, they, they got to have some gems for us in the small ones. So when we get to the small schools, uh, I'm going to hold them to that. But uh, until we see you again, uh, as always, remember uh, you can eat your betting money, but please don't bet you're eating money.